Hello and welcome to ISO 400. I'm your host, Julius Motel. This week I'm talking with Brian Matias, a landscape and travel photographer based in Portland, Oregon, who has had a series of creative rebirths throughout his career. He's also worked in an educational capacity at On One Software for several years before moving on to Google and working closely with Google Plus Photos, Nick, and other photography platforms under Google. And he now works on contract as part of Sony's Image Artisans program while also pursuing his own creative endeavors. And as always, our music is provided by Yuki Futami, a New York-based jazz musician. Thanks so much and hope you enjoy. Oh. Uh, welcome to the show. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Ten hours is a substantial time difference. <laughs> I, I appreciate you accommodating a nice 10 a.m. That's like, gave me, I got up at 9, I showered, <laughs> have my coffee. <laughs> All it's, so I appreciate it. No, and it's good because I just ate dinner. It's it all's all's well, satisfied. On both ends. <laughs> I see everyone. Everyone is happy. It works out. Now, in in like you know studying stuff you've done, one thing I think is unique to your experience, um, in the way that myself and a lot of photographers experience, um, whether it's software or online platforms for photography, it's always either on the receiving end or like in the participatory sense, but you've been behind the scenes. You've been, you've worked at On One, you've worked um, at Google managing, you know, working with all their various photo related products, Nick, Google Plus Photos, and now you're with um, Sony. What has that been like to be a photographer sort of behind the scenes at these places? I think that's actually, the, I think that's the first time anyone's ever, like we've ever discussed that, hmm. um, that, 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 you know, um, it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's for sure. Um, so one of the things that, that I, f what I, one of the things I, I love about that experience that mm -hmm. I've had with Google and with on one, um, and now even with Sony is I, I get to work, uh, with a bunch of really talented photographers, mm -hmm. um, but not in the um, public side of things, like right. on a shoot or something. It's more in the business side. Um, and you really kind of get to know uh, people. You know, the photographer, when they're on that side, on the, on the inside, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily a photographer. They're, you know, there is a business person or right. it's, it's, it's a different side. And it's a side that you kind of keep private you know you don't you sure. don't make it yeah you don't make it far if you're just like talking about how this person is or that person is but sure. um you know the 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 it, it's given me an appreciation for the business side of photography and we were just talking about this before the show started right because, um uh you know there's all this kind of you know you know those uh memes where it's like you know my job like what my girlfriend thinks I do, what my mom thinks I do, right, what right, my, right, right. You know, parent, yeah, and what I actually do, right. Um, with photography, that's that's the experiences I've I've had. Very much kind of, I see you online, and I, you know, speaking with people, people mostly f fantasize or they romanticize about what I what I wish my I would I was doing versus yeah. what I actually am doing, and so there's a lot to the to photography. Um, like getting an accountant and managing your finances sure. and having a business plan um, that these experiences at these companies have given me an appreciation for. Yeah. And do you, how do you find um, that? Have you, do you think you've changed at all photographically having worked for these companies? Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's also a really good question. Um, immediately what came to mind was Google, my experience at Google. So, mm. Um, obviously with Google, everything was, or still is about mobile, um, right? You know, there was an edict mobile first. Mm. Um, no one, no one can release a feature or product for the desktop that didn't work on mobile first. Mm -hmm. And so there was this period, um, and you can go back, uh, you know, especially on Google plus and see right. where I was migrating to this kind of mobile first, mobile only workflow where mm. I had um, embraced my camera phone more than my actual camera for a period. And so mm. that changed, up, you know, and also up until that point, before Google, I was working at On One, and On mm -hmm. One primarily is 
desktop software. Right. So I was working like most of us on our desktops. Um, but at Google, um, I was embracing more of the, all right, if I am using my camera, I'll transfer my photos to my phone over Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. That was a fundamental shift in my traditional photo editing workflow. Okay. And what, um, before, before you came to on one, were you just, were you working as a freelance photographer or what? So what was your, what was your work before on one? Um, before on one, uh, so there was a period, I can't remember the years and this kind of goes back to the whole photographers not having a business plan or, sure. you know, um, so there was a, a spate where I, um, had my own, I call it a business, but it wasn't a business. I didn't have, I wasn't incorporated. I didn't have an LLC or an S corp, sure. but I was doing commercial photography for like, I did stuff for like the intercontinental Boston. I did stuff for a bunch mm. of little B and B's sure. in, um, in, on Cape Cod. And so I was doing that in like restaurants. Um, I would, op I would photograph restaurants for their websites and stuff like that. Um, so that's what I did that before, but that was like so many photographers kind of like, that was not a full time thing. Right. I was actually working at, I don't remember where I was working at. I was working at a financial software company. Okay, so it wasn't um, photography related in at downtown all. Boston. No, my so my full time position, um, like what paid the bills was this um, photography software company. Oh, I'm sorry, financial software company in downtown Boston called Omgeo. Okay, that's what it was. I'm trying to remember the company. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and so I was doing this commercial stuff on the side. Sure. Uh, and it was getting it was picking up its pace. Yeah. And right around that time when it when it was actually getting to the point where I did have to make a decision. Mm. Uh, on one came into the picture because I was using, I was kind of a devout user of on one's uh, sure. uh, software. And so they offered me this position to create, I became their curriculum and education manager. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was all about creating content. Nice. And, and for a lot of, for a lot of photographers, it, I'm sure it's the case where what they'd love to be doing full time is photography, but it just, they, they can't, make it work so they have a full-time job that they do and they try and fill whatever time they do have with photography so while you were working at that the financial software company how did you strike a balance between what you love to do which was taking pictures and what was paying the bills so there were times where i would have to take a day off or i'd go during my lunch hour hmm. um because most of a lot of the clients that i had at that time were in downtown so it was it was actually quite convenient <laughs> and this was um, or in Martha. Was this in New York or where? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry no, it's okay. Boston. Boston. Okay. Yeah. Um, but like the, the ones that are, were further out, those required me to go on the weekend and we just had to kind of like cordon off certain areas um, mm -hmm. for me to get the photos. But uh, some sort of art director that mm -hmm. would kind of, you know, they would, we would set the scene up, make sure that, you know, the pillows were fluffy and that wasn't some random power cord right. dangling some. Um, it was fun. It wasn't the kind of photography, like it, it was, I guess it was a labor of love, mm -hmm. but, you know, for me, photography was walking around and just taking photos of, at that time, architecture and stuff like sure. that. Sure. Um, and how did the opportunity at On One sort of present itself? How did that manifest? That's a funny, kind of a funny to me story. <laughs> um, so I, w I went to my very first Photoshop world um, mm. in Boston and on one was there and I bought my copy of, because at the time, admittedly, I was, uh, I was using a not kosher version of the suite. Sure. Um, <laughs> but, but I, I always told myself that when uh, things are so many people uh, at that time mm -hmm. said, um, <clears throat> I would pay for it. And so I did. I went to the to the booth mm -hmm. and I, I bought my copy. And uh, w they had a like a, a raffle or a drawing for only if you for people who bought the suite. So sure. if you bought the suite, you get a ticket and the prize was crazy. It was like this beautiful donkey bag 
Mm. Um, a copy of Photoshop CS6, a copy of Lightroom. I think it was Lightroom 2 at the time. Mm. And a handful, oh, an Expo disc and a few other things. Sure. And so it, it was like this bound. Anyway, long story short, <laughs> you had to be, you know, the drawing was at the end of the day. Right. And you have to be present. So I came back and I, I won the drawing. Very nice. And so, oh, so it was awesome. Um, <laughs> I remember, though, I felt like such a, a jerk because you, this has nothing to do with story, but I remember the copy of Photoshop was for Windows. And, and you had Mac. I don't know if you remember, like, and I had a Mac. And so uh, and at that time, the licenses were not trans. Right. And I remember just kind of like, hey, I'm sorry. Can I get a, a Mac license? Ah. Um, <laughs> anyway, I had used the products for so long, and I really kind of came to depend on them. So especially after I won, um, I developed a relationship with, you know, their head of sales and the head of marketing. And so mm -hmm. every so often I would send them photos like, mm -hmm. hey, edit this with yours. Enjoy it. You know, use it. <clears throat> and so from that, that led to them asking if I wanted to present at, uh, I think, Photoshop World or some other show. Mm -hmm. um, and I did. And then they're like, hey, do you want to do webinars with us? Because at the time, webinars were still huge. Right. And all of that snowballed into um, them asking, like, hey, do you want to just do this for us full time as you know, an education manager? Just create content. Sure. And that is how it happened. So I, <clears throat> I saw that as for me, the best of both worlds. Um, because I'm risk averse. I'm a very kind of timid person. Sure. And um, it, what it was, it gave me the kind of security of a full-time job with benefits and all right, that stuff. Right, right. But it also kept me in the photo industry. Like I got paid to go travel, to shoot, to create content. Right. Um, and so um, that was the first, my first foray into this industry of ours. And, and what was that? that transition like into into doing something in the industry full time it it was it was great um it was different the the, the biggest difference mm -hmm. was now i had to balance building my brand mm. of brian, brian matish and then building on one because when you lay it out yeah my a, a huge component of my job was to help build on one the mind share around on one software. Sure. Um, yeah. And so what happened uh, invariably and not for good or bad, just what, what happened was I became the, the on one guy. Right. Um, and the same thing happened at Google. Right. Where I became kind of the Google Photos guy. And then mm. even at Sony now, even though I'm, I, contract with Sony like they're a client of mine mm -hmm. I'm becoming kind of the Sony guy hmm. and so I, I try to be very careful because I don't want to be anyone's guy I'm well, right. Brian right yeah. um, and how did you were you able to strike any kind of a balance while you were working on on one's brand or on Google's brand and also sort of carve out space to develop your stuff I heard it was, you were asking me if I was able to strike what strike any kind of a balance so that you were, you know, fulfilling your professional obligations, but also wanting to fulfill sort of your personal, you know, Brian Matias obligations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't want to make it seem like it was this, um, that it was hard to make a, no, any of sort of delineation between, but, but yeah, that's, it's a fair question. Um, yeah, it, 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 it to this day is mm. a challenge. Yeah. Um, because you only have, you know, so many hours in the day. Yeah. Um, oh, I know. And yeah, exactly. And and you also know that within those hours, you only have so much kind of like capacity for creativity and yeah. like before you have this kind of mental fatigue. Right. And so I remember it on one, like creating a video is it's so much easier for you to create to be creative um uh at your own pace. Right. It's a different story. Which I'm sure you can relate I, to, where I you have to be creative on on, yeah, on, deadline. on demand, on deadline. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you need you need this stuff out, and so that's why I have a lot of respect for people like you and people like uh, uh, online bloggers who are you know sure. successful bloggers because yeah. you have to feed that machine, you know, pumping those quarters in. Yeah. Um, and so I was being paid mm -hmm. uh, to do a job, to right. do a good job, 
And so I, my priority had always been to, you know, do content, create content f- to support the brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the off time, I would try to, you know, I, I wouldn't try. I mean, I'm not saying I was, it was like terribly difficult, but you know, I, what I tried to do is like when I did have pockets of time where I felt creative for myself, mm. um, I would create a surge of posts and I would schedule them out. This was still, right. you know, Facebook was not nearly what it was back then and, uh, and mm. blogs were still kind of king. So I would schedule out right. my posts like crazy. Um, but yeah, man, it was, it was, it still is. Yeah. Still is a show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm sure... I mean, I've gone through it. I've had friends who've gone through it. You kind of hit sort of creative slumps and, you know, trying to be creative all the time can kind of, you know, it can wear you out. You can, it can run yourself ragged. Um, and I'm wondering how, how have you in your capacity through on one Google and, and Sony, it's kind of on contract, but to an extent, um, how do you push through those slumps? Oh man. <laughs> How? Um, I think the what my wife always reminds me, and she's like my inspiration. Mm. If you if I keep saying if you ever want to, um, if you if you need a model or some sort of a case study to model what success as an independent photographer looks like, mm. you just need to look at her. Um, she always reminds me that. Like when I do go through these slumps to just like not beat myself up because I, I you yeah. know, I don't know if you're like me, you know, you beat yourself up, you're your, your harshest critic. Oh yeah. And you, yeah. And you yeah. see, you're, you're trying to keep up with the Joneses and you see mm. what the other people are like just putting stuff out and it's mm-hmm. good stuff. Um, so when I get into those slumps, I try, I really, I really try to, um, remember that like, okay, you know, it's okay. Mm. Um, I've I've gotten to this point now, you know, a couple of years ago, it would I would like castrate myself if I missed a day to put a new photo out. Sure. Like that. And I was doing that consistently for several years and now, you know, this is not the I don't believe what I'm doing is the right thing, but like I'll go like two or three days without posting something cuz I just I just can't. It's like you're literally on fumes. Yeah. Um so it's usually though what's kind of ironic is it's in those days where I'm not doing anything where the the, the juices start to you know bubble up again. Mm-hmm. So how long were you with on one, and then how did the Google opportunity come along? Also, I mean, just to exemplify um, and illustrate how small of an industry it is. Sure. Uh, so I was at one for, on one for about three years, mm-hmm. and there I, I will always be eternally grateful to them because my first year at on one I worked remotely from Boston, so that's oh, not nice. quite our yeah. Sure. We, it's not the kind of time difference we have. It's a three hour time difference, right? But it's a three thousand mile difference as well. Um, they were the my second year. I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to move to Portland. And right. so Portland. If it wasn't for on one, I would never have. I would never probably come visit Portland. I'm a mm. bro- I'm from New York City. Like me too. I never. Sh- oh really? Yeah. Oh where? Uh, born in Manhattan, raised in Queens, went to high school in Brooklyn. Oh awesome. Oh awesome. fantastic. We have to talk about that. Yeah, later. we will. Uh, my second, my after the first year working remotely, I worked. A, I I worked in Portland. Now, mm-hmm. in terms of the industry itself, you know, you go to all these trade shows. Um, right. Like that's where I most of the times that's where I see Chris. Right. Um, and. I, it's so funny. Like, so there was on one, and there was obviously Nick, and it was kind of like the DC and Marvel sure. of <laughs> photo editing. People wanted to believe that, like, we hated each other and mm. like all this stuff. But you know, Josh uh, Haftel mm-hmm. at the time was a, the product manager for for Nick, mm-hmm. and Josh is such he's an awesome dude, and we would. You know, we'd see each other three, four times a year because we'd go to all the same trade shows, mm. and it got to this point where we were, we were like, "Why aren't we doing something together? Like, mm. why aren't we doing some sort of like cross promotion?" Because yes, there are some overlapping products from the the Nick collection and the the suite, the Perfect Photo Suite, but there right. are also some really complementary, like 
at the time we didn't have a black and white product so let's do some silver effects and perfect resize so you can do this beautiful sure. black and white and enlarge it and make a canvas print and so we always had a good relationship I really really admired Josh so then at some point Google acquired Nick mm -hmm. and Josh was was uh, kind of um, enveloped into into Google mm -hmm. as a product manager and so however it was internally I didn't have any any visibility into that but it just, uh, there was a Josh made a point that like we need some sort of a kind of uh, evangelist for photos because mm -hmm. the photos at that time Google Plus was just starting to explode and photographers were flocking to it and, yeah uh, hangouts was a huge thing and so he reached out to me this I in my wildest dreams never thought I'd, I'd sure. be an employee of Google um, and so he reached out and he was like hey um, are you interested in this um, it would require you to move down to uh, you know the South Bay sure and um, and here it is so you know me applying for it was a formality I went through the you know five rounds of interviews and everything but um, I got the role I got the offer yeah and for two years it was like working for one of the coolest companies if not the coolest company in the world hmm. it well, was a lot of fun yeah, I'm sure. I, I've heard. I have a friend who works for Google, and he loves the lunches. Um, I, I so I, I <laughs> this morning, I just I hit my new low weight. When oh, good. I left Google. I was 247 pounds. Yeah, Jeez. I was a fatty. Oh, so when I came to Google, I was 180 some odd pounds. Yeah. My first year, I gained something like 20 some odd pounds, my and when God. I left, I was at 247 at my fattest, and. Um, I just this morning I was 198, so I've lost about 50 pounds so far. Congratulations! Um, I'm, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm slowly burning off the Google. <laughs> oh <laughs> man! Um, just, so what? It, I mean, something I noticed with Google Plus is it's incredibly popular with photographers. And what do you think it is about the service that made it such a hit for photographers more so than anybody else? It was because. Um, now, and I'm speaking as a user, not as a sure. you know, oh, former of course. The reason why I flocked to Google was because of how it clearly respected the photos. Hmm. Um, like, the photos were displayed big, and when you open in the light box, it was displayed beautifully, and it was displayed in, like, shortly after it launched, they started supporting full-res JPEGs, and hmm. um, it, it just, it, it was... It was the first major kind of like alternative, I think, at the time to Facebook. I mean, you started off with like Friendster and MySpace, and then you had Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, there was like Facebook and Twitter. Twitter was more of a, I would think, a consumption vehicle than a, a sure. broadcast one. Um, and so you had Facebook and Google Plus, and you know, all of a sudden, Google Plus had this other thing like the Hangouts, which I think was a huge yeah. thing at the time. Like. That's how I met my wife. You know, that's mm. how I met the dude who married me and my wife. That's how I met my realtor. That's how I met most of my friends today. Right. Um, was through Google Plus. So I am very grateful to them too. I, I also at the time, the mindset was: remember, Google had just bought Nick, and Nick mm. was like a huge, the big, yeah, yeah the big gorilla. Um, I mean, it wasn't Adobe, but it was in terms of like plugins and photo editing. They were, you know, big yeah. guys. So um, I think it showed photo enthusiasts that like, oh, wow, like this is something I should consider. Right. Yeah. Oh, and they had that, their, their photo Google Plus photography conference. That was also before I was hired. Huh. Um, you know, yeah, there was a conference in San Francisco. It was, it was partnered with, with Kelby Media. Hmm. Um, and it was like, when has a social channel a social network ever created a a photo conference right yeah. um, it was the one and only you know it was not without its challenges but sure. i was a panel speaker there and i had a blast nice yeah. nice um now if we could go um back a bit how did you how did you first come to photography and when do you feel when did you feel you finally kind of hit your stride as a photographer so i started i mean my my right very my freshman year of college, I mm. went to Syracuse University, and um, 
I had, that was the first time I left Brooklyn. Like, ah, okay. how to do anything for myself um, because my mom did all that stuff for me. Yeah. Um, and she, I mean, for better or worse, that was my life. It was a very, I was a very, uh, kind of still am a shy guy, shy kid. Um, mm. And I was totally sheltered always either on a cruise or um, in a all-inclusive place where mm. we didn't have to go anywhere. Everything was kind of there for us. That's just kind of how my parents uh, sure. operate. And, um, and so when I went to college, man, I had a hard time, mm. hard time adjusting. I was uh, very, very, uh, what's the word, separate. I had a lot of separation anxiety. Sure. Um, and so one of the things, I can't remember who it was or what, if I think my parents bought me or someone, somehow I got a Canon AE-1. Mm. This was still years before consumer grade digital cameras were available. Okay. Um, and so I had a Canon AE-1 and um, I wish I could remember, but what I do remember is someone told me or came into my mind that like, Photography is a great way to deal a coping mechanism for social anxiety because when you go out and kind of, you know how like a lot of people who have kind of social anxiety, they actually wear sunglasses because you can't see their eyes. Sure. Yeah. Um, so people are like, well, you, with a camera, you can you kind of hold in front of your face and it kind of still lets you experience the world, but you're kind mm -hmm. of like behind this thing. Yeah. Um, and so that is... Um, that is how I first uh, about photography. Not, not, and to this day, I've never taken a, an academic class about photography or sure. art or anything like that. Um, but growing up in, in New York City, mm -hmm. I, my, my kind of affinity was for architecture. I, mm -hmm. I had no desire to shoot people. Hmm. Um, and that's another thing is like, I was mostly shooting upwards, so I never really, people walking around never really concerned themselves with me. Right. Um, but it got me out of the house. It got uh, sure. right out of the door. Um, and it really kind of, I was like, man, I love this. <laughs> and so, oh, I should square. I, I did take um, developing classes, but that wasn't until later on. Sure. Um, uh, I would drop my film off at the Bursar at the, at the student center and racked up some heavy bills. Because <laughs> I was, you know, I had the digital photographer's mindset with film. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, um, you had, the second part of your question was like when I kind of hit my stride, I guess. Um, damn, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, uh, I I really don't know. Sometimes I feel like I haven't even hit my stride yet. Um, oh, okay. So uh, I. It's been a while. I mean, if sure. you want to, if I, to interpret the question, like how long have I been really comfortable? Like it's been quite a while. Um, but it, it, it was, uh, I, it went in phases. Like there came to a point where I felt super comfortable with my architecture mm -hmm. photography. And then I kind of adopted this, uh, urbex and abandonment photography. Like right. that kind of, and the architecture lent itself there. It wasn't until I moved to Portland where I first, my my everything I knew about photography completely shifted, and I totally became obsessed with the landscape and nature. Mm -hmm. Up until that waterfall, I never shot sunset or sunrise. Never. Right. Um, right. And like, I never needed insulated jackets or sleeping bags. I never camped once in my life. Huh. My parents never, <laughs> never went camping. Um, so. I had to learn all that stuff. So that was kind of like a, a, a rebirth. And, and I'm actually right now going through, I think, through another rebirth. Because um, mm. I was just in Nicaragua like two, three weeks, two or three weeks ago. That was the first time that I um, really shot portraits. Like, mm. of the, like I never, I never would go to someone and ask, especially in Spanish or in not my native language. Sure. If it'd be okay to photograph. It, you, it would just not happen. But on this trip, it did. It hadn't mm. happened a lot to the point where towards the end, I was like, oh, man, I can't wait to do this at home. Hmm. So I feel like I'm going through kind of another rebirth um, where I, I, I kind of want to hit the streets and just kind of like see what I can do with locals here. Sure. And what changed? I mean, from so like was the change with 
architecture to landscape kind of instantaneous or gradual? And then what about moving from sort of landscape to people? Instantaneous? Um, very close to instantaneous. Well, I remember when I, my colleague, my on-one colleague, the first waterfall I went to see, which I think is pretty common, is, is Multnomah Falls, which is kind mm-hmm. of like the, the Disneyland of waterfalls. Just like <laughs> everyone goes to it. Right. Um, and it's, you know, it's just so verdant and lush and green. And mm. like, wow. Um, and then as I explored more and I saw, you know, it just was, it was this, it was more challenging than any architecture I've ever had to shoot because like, you know, you're hiking right. and you're, you know, scrambling up and down the sides of hills and whatnot. Um, but also just the satisfaction, um, breathing fresh air and, you know, sure. Putting an ND, I never used ND filters. Ah, oh, no, I did a little bit sometimes, hmm. but you know where polarizers and NDs became kind of like as important as the camera and the tripod. Right. Um, and it was also the first time where I kind of started veering away from any sort of like HDR and tone mapping and that kind of stuff, which hmm. I had up until that point been like obsessed with. For, right. For, you know, like so many photographers, um, it, it kind of like I kind of started appreciating you know, embracing shadows and, and like just trying to get everything right in a single exposure. That's the kind of simplicity of, of nature. Mm-hmm. I think that kind of, I kind of, um, learned to appreciate, mm-hmm. um, with people that was like, man, I remember the first day, day and a half when we were we were like integrated in the local, um, community. And this is in Nicaragua. This is in Granada, Nicaragua. Granada. Okay. Um, yeah, we were we were like roaming through the barrios um, with the children that we were working with, mm-hmm. um, and in the first day or so, aside from the just crazy culture shock and like seeing what true poverty sure. looks like, um, I was in a different state. And then um, after a bit, you just kind of I just uh, something changed. Right, I was like, everyone was so friendly. You know, you look at them and mm. you know, hold my camera. Like, you know, stop in. <laughs> and, uh, and they would smile and, you know, trying to, uh, break that because their, their initial, I, I came to learn that like their initial, um, response was to smile at the camera. Like, no, no, no. I'm like, you know, you just do, just, just be, you just be, exist. Just be. Yeah. Yeah. Just do like, you know, there was a woman who was doing a crossword puzzle and was like, no, no, no. You know? And so, um, I just, when I realized that they weren't going to like, give me a scowl and you know curse sure. me out that's that's what i would do if someone came to me right um just because i'm you know you typical kind of new yorker paranoid and like uh, get out of my space mm. um once i realized that these people are amiable it was uh it was game on sure uh, and portlanders are kind of friendly people too mm-hmm. they're, they're kind of you know pacifist um do no harm type of people. So I'm hoping to kind of like find some similar luck here. Yeah. And, and what was it like for you having, having focused on sort of, you know, empty spaces, whether it was architecture, urbex, or, you know, these lush landscapes, and then to finally, you know, turn your lens on a person for like, you know, your first considered time, like, what was that like for you? Uh, it was, it was great. And, And part of the reason was, you know, I, I love all photography Mm. And, you know, I don't know if you're like me, like a lot of times when I'm kind of just hanging out, I'll throw up the 500 PX uh, app on my iPad and I'll just browse through. Mm. And uh, I did portrait street photography and I Mm. see like, man, these are so good. I mean, talk about that decisive moment. Sure. And so when I was there and I would start kind of taking my photos and, you know, chimping at them for a bit. And I saw my, like, holy crap, this is actually not terrible. Like the eyes are, are open and they're tack sharp and there's just a, um, a sense of place. Mm. I was like, I got super excited. And it was the same excitement I got when I started learning how to compose waterfalls and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, and why I'm excited is because even with landscapes, I'm kind of getting to that point where like, you know, I still love it, but mm-hmm. I want to do something different. Um, sure. But I, I, you'll never, I shouldn't say never, but 
it's important. There's an important distinction there. I have absolutely no desire to do um, like portrait shoots, like hire models and go out. And oh, do- sure, with like studio lights and all that. I have no desire whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I just want to kind of catch people um, doing their thing, like in their element. Um, mm-hmm. I never wanted. I shot two weddings when I there was a small window there when sure. I was living in Boston, where I thought oh, I could be a wedding photographer. Um, and I bought my pocket wizards and my, you know, um, my uh, or cannons, the speed lights. And right. I had my stuff and I was learning to ratio and I was all this junk, my right. modifiers. Oh, my God. I had the worst time at both weddings. Oh, boy. I, no, no, no. <laughs> no, uh, I hear you. No, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I get it. <laughs> the, the products were good. The, the party. But just. They always say a good wedding photographer is, is also a great therapist, and I, I'm the one that needs a therapist. So, sure. yeah. <laughs> like, I just wasn't good at it, um, and I, I kind of came up with my own saying. It's like, I don't ever need to inst- instruct a waterfall or a mountain. I don't, sure. and the mountain will never talk back to me. It's, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm not talking. A good portrait wedding photographer is multitasking. Like, all right, do this. Then I'm like, I can't do that. Sure. Right. Um, so yeah. And and for a time too, um, and and I, I've seen you participate in discussions, whether it was on Reddit or on your website, um, heavily into HDR photography. Um, mm-hmm. How did you? I mean, I'm sure you came into that with the advent of digital. Um, what was that mm-hmm. like for you? And I know that there was, has been sort of a stigma with HDR photography that it can be like an easy way to make a photo look interesting, but you really kind of pushed past that. And I'm wondering how you did that and how that was for you. Sure. Uh, that's actually totally, totally fair question. Um, initially, um, I think like, I think a lot of photographers can, can relate where you, when you first, um, I can even do the analogy of like doing a long, my first long exposure here. Right. With an ND filter. When you first see it and you see what you did and you see the result, yeah, and it's just kind of so novel, yeah. Um, you kind of like I don't know, like you. I'm kind of an obsessive. I have an obsessive personality where it's like if there's something like that, I will, you know, go ahead, you know, head on. Yeah, I, so I, HDR I, was I like, it. yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us uh, have that same mentality because it's like it's a visual gratification. It's like holy crap, look at this thing. And so. Um, I just went on this bender, and uh, I would tone map everything. I would tone map things that absolutely had no reason to be. T- I would tone map a a wall. Hmm. Like, what do you need to tone map a wall for? <laughs> I mean, unless like one part of it is in pure sunlight, and one of it is one part is in shade, and even then, like, sure, emb- embrace the shadows. Um, I um, I went nuts, mm. and. I did one of those 365 challenges successfully where, you know, for th- every day for a year, a new HDR image. It didn't do much for me. I felt myself kind of um, cheapening my work. Hmm. But professionally, it was massive because at the time, there were very few people who were doing it consistently and doing it well. Mm-hmm. Well is a very subjective term. At the time, sure. people seemed to like the work. Um, when I look at it now, I cringe at my own work. I'm, but I, I will. Never I, I understand. I going yeah, back yeah. and looking at old stuff. Oh boy. Hey, you know. But I, I will never take that stuff down because I want people to see. Like this is what I at one point found aesthetically pleasing. Sure. Um, but professionally, doing that was a huge boon. Um, sure. Because um, it was just really good, uh, and eventually. I think especially with um, landscape, when I started realizing kind of the, the, the clinical use of, of HDR. Mm-hmm. And HDR, technically using a filter is a form of HDR, you know, you're mm-hmm. just compensating for, dy- for the dynamic range. Sure. Um, what I came to realize is tone mapping, which is more of this digital version of HDR, um, it's, it's, it's not a, I don't treat it as an aesthetic it's like um, a hammer and nails or, sure. or, or a wrench. It's a tool. It's just simply that it's a tool. It's not, a st- it's not for stylization. It's for the very point of HDR is to be able to compensate for the camera sensor's inability to capture 
mm -hmm. um, great tonal range. Right. And so if that means taking several exposures at different you know, exposure times or shutter speeds and then using software to combine that to create kind of now I have my, my highlights and my midtones and my shadows. Mm -hmm. um, then upon that is where I would stylize. But when you have these people who are kind of taken to extremes and um, they're introducing, you know, I'm saying HDR is here to solve a problem. But right. HDR in and of itself can introduce problems when it's not used. Right. And so that's kind of where I found myself early on. Mm -hmm. um, now I use it. I can't even remember the last time I've tone mapped. I use Lightroom's built in with Lightroom 6. Sure. Um, does a good job. Uh, but I I much rather throw on a like a soft grad neutral density filter and just darken the sky in camera. Not because I'm a purist. Sure. Just, it's just that's what's my in my mind right now. Right. Yeah. And I I, I find I, I find too with work I've seen online from other photographers who do HDR, not just for, you know, landscape stuff. They'll do it for whatever it is they're shooting. Um, and a lot of times it often becomes more about the style of the image than the yes. substance. They're more stylistically interesting than they are substantively interesting. And I'm wondering, how do you, like, how would you caution someone against that? I, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, and, and what I think there is, uh, for those people... Is, I'm making an assumption, but it sure. could be that they are, they are kind of like I was, and, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so they're that's to them. It could be that that's simply the aesthetic that that they want to align themselves with. Sure. In, at this, but as long I think as long as they, as long as it's done with intent. Um, mm -hmm. And they're kind of true to it. I can't. I, I can't fault them. You know, sure. I may not like it, and you may not like it, and of that's course. fine. I, but I'll promise you one thing: there will be people who will like it. Um, oh yeah, no, well, definitely. Yeah. I just. I, I don't. I don't want people to make the mistake I did, where I, where it's like everything or nothing. Like mm -hmm. everything I did was tone. Like I don't know how many terabytes of data I have there oh are just simply God. brackets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. It's like there's no reason to have all these photos. But um but yeah, I mean if that's the way that someone will learn, you know, yeah. and, and, and grow, you know, you gotta you gotta crawl before you can walk. No, this is true. And what was it I, I I'm at just in, in my own photography, like moving finding a new style, a new method of expression, it can kind of be like uncharted territory and a little unsettling when you move away from something you've done for a while into this new thing and trying to figure out how to move again. What was it like for you moving out of HDR and into, as you were saying with landscapes before, you were, you were the simplicity of nature kind of helped you embrace the single exposure, you know, mm -hmm. getting it all in one shot. So what was that like for you transitioning out into something new? It was it was nerve wracking because, you know, for better or worse, a big part of my brand was like people associated me with HDR. Sure. With tone mapping, it was just I wrote articles about it. I was featured in in books about HDR and like like I said, it was it was while creatively it might have been stifling, it was really good for me professionally. Sure. Um, there were there were people who were like, what what the hell's going on? <laughs> like, why are you are you oh yeah i mean i was scared about redefining myself or like mm. making people who or my fans feel like i was um not abandoning them but like deceiving them mm. or selling out or whatever i didn't i i never preach well listen, sure I, you do what, what you think is best for yourself um but I try not to, you know. I didn't. I didn't ever go on some soapbox and say, "Oh, I've seen the light," and you know, <laughs> HDR is the devil. Right. Um, right. <laughs> it just. I. I wouldn't fault anyone for for wanting to kind yeah, uh, of course. expand their. But what was it like? It was awesome. Like mm. it was, it was exhilarating not to have to. I. 
have you ever heard of this device called a promote control? No, what is that? I mean, with so with tone mapping, with HDR, you know, you want to get a bunch of brackets, right? Right. And at the time, I think only a handful of cameras, Nikons were doing it, but most Canons were, were doing three, I think the 5D2 or the 5D3 introduced a higher. But I had this a promote control, this random guy in Texas hmm. created this device. It was like this big. It was about... Uh, the size of like uh, a little Walkman, maybe a little bit smaller. Sure. For those who know what Walkmans are. Yes. Um, <laughs> cassette tape? What? <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, you connect it tethered to your, um, your camera mm-hmm. using two cables. Um, and effectively, it issued bracketing commands to the camera. Huh. So I could, I could get... 99 brackets if I wanted to. It would just issue the commands to the camera. Jesus. So that's... when I... Oh, yeah. It was... For its time, it was fantastic. I, I I, mean, had he been a larger organization, it would have been a bigger device. Mm. Um, but uh, when I, it was so nice and refreshing to kind of not have to worry about getting all these brackets mm. um, and like carrying this other device and all this stuff. And who are, you know, getting most of the cameras out there today, especially if they haven't come from the older stuff, don't know how good they have it because Mm. I started to appreciate just how much data there is in Mm. these raw files. Like we were at that, when we first connected here, we were talking about the A7R2. Right. You know, in one of those files, there's a ton of dynamic range. So yeah. I can lift out some shadows or bring out the hi- or you know recover some of the highlights. And um, once I learned to appreciate that and really kind of uh, become intimate with how much uh, latitude I have in terms mm. of t- dynamic range, it was really a, a free experience where I didn't have to worry about um, you know did I get the right amount of brackets or and also on the flip side when I'm back home. It's that much less time I need to tone map and do that stuff. It's one process I cut out of the equation. Right. So where are you now with your photography, and, and what do you think's next for you? What was that? Where uh, am I now? What? Where are you now with your photography, um, and, and what do you think's going to come next? Or what are you looking to do next? Um, well, I'm st- uh, you know, uh, part of the reason why I... I start. I incorporated. I, I I officially launched my my company on the first of January. Mm-hmm. Um, was I was I started you know content creating content kind of is in my blood. Sure. And uh, again, you know, referring to my wife, um, she she's found tons of success with her own kind of online store creating content. Right. Um, and so. We both, she kind of showed me how important having uh, just creating kind of premium content that I can, uh, that is sold on the store. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a big focus of mine. The photography, that all serves into the content creation. Sure. I couldn't imagine myself being a commercial photographer today where, you know, I need to solicit or seek out companies to photograph like my buddy Ben Moon who's a he's a local Portland photographer and he's a uh, also we're both members of the artisans of imagery program for Sony sure um, you know he shoots for Patagonia and like you know I, his business his way of thinking and doing is so different than mine and mm-hmm. yet we're both working photographers right so, so um, for me it's just continuing to build the brand, um, build products that are, uh, meaningful, mm-hmm. uh, you know, eBooks and, uh, tutor- training videos, things that are bite-sized. I'm, I'm sure I'm moving away from like these bigger, grandiose, expensive products and more into these small snapshots, like, you know, $5 thing here, $5 thing there that, um, that is, that are episodic, mm-hmm. you know, not like this big thing, but like, yeah, I want that one and that one, kind of like a a buffet. Mm-hmm. 
that's how I'm approaching that. And my newsletter has been growing really nicely. Um, so, so that's kind of it's more I'm focusing more on the business side. The photography is what the photography is kind of the one part that feeds the business. It's not mm -hmm. the business. Sure. And is there uh, so you've kind of had this this growth from shooting architecture and then to shooting nature and now kind of segueing into portraits. Is there a genre that you've kind of had your eye on but haven't yet explored that you want to? Portrait stuff, the kind of, again, candid kind of street stuff mm -hmm. um, is what I'm most excited about now. Mm -hmm. But I want to be very kind of methodical because I know this is going to come across as totally arrogant. Mm. And I, I apologize, but like... It's okay. So much of what I see is uh, that's labeled as street photography to me boils down to nothing more than the photographer was standing on the street and took a photo. That's a whole big discussion happening right now. Trust me, I'm I'm aware. <laughs> oh, good. I, I'm not, and and I'm saying this solely from one person. No, right. I would love to, to hear that conversation. Yeah, there's um, plenty of stuff being written about and talked about. It's it's really trust me. It's it's an understood kind of aspect of the genre huh that's that's good to know because i um i i would be the fly in the wall i would have nothing to contribute sure to that but i would that excites me now because i i, I wasn't sure no um, it, it, it's totally interesting scene and there's like it has to be at least one person walking and that's like <laughs> that seems yeah. to be the, the the sort of the quintessential and not in sort of like a nostalgic this is what it was sense, sort of a stereotypical someone says, I do street photography and you see the work and it's it's people walking. It's that it's like bonus points for an umbrella in the frame or like sure. shot through a coffee shop window. Um it just when I see this stuff and this is why I'm so kind of hesitant, why I'm very, very nervous, is because the last thing I want is to just contribute to that. I right. see so much of this work and it just, again, I feel like such an arrogant asshole, but it's like, it's so uninspired. It's so yeah. contrived. And like, yeah. like, did you, well, to me, if I were, if you were to ask me right now, so I'll just ask myself, like, Go ahead. what the street photography connotate or like what does how does it embody i think so much of what i see i read these are i do read some of these articles on like f-stoppers and on uh, everywhere like 10 tips for street photography and and always always invariably this one like you know you, you know if you're uncomfortable use a longer lens and, and to me that's where you yeah. like when I when I, earlier when we were when I was saying how like you know I would actually interact with the person yeah um, you know I know there's a school of thought that like once you interact you kind of destroy the candid part of it mm. um, but there has to be a balance like the whole point is to kind of integrate yourself um, if I'm standing on a corner like a creeper and just kind of like literally just standing there and waiting for someone to come to me it's like it's like me taking a big net and throwing it into a, a school of fish and just kind of like, you're just standing there, mm. you know, and some, every so often you pull your net back and you look and you throw it back out. There's, there's not, there's nothing there. There's no, like, I don't know. Um, I know when I see a good street photo and I, 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 I'm sure you do too. Sure. Like, yeah, of course. There you go. That's, that is, you have a sense of place. Right. Um, but yeah, I see these. Uh, yeah, the whole walking thing. It just, it's. I don't know. It just. I would rather have a see a photo of a person looking at the camera scowling, than I would their backside walking away from me, catching yeah. them mid stride. Yeah. Um, it doesn't do anything for me. Um, like, it's the equivalent I would say in landscape. As if if I were to walk up to a brook or a stream and set my tripod and camera at eye level, standing up, perfectly comfortable, mm. and take that shot, which is kind of the contrived, no effort whatsoever shot, versus, sure. all right, I'm gonna get my, I'm gonna splay my tripod tripod legs out as far I'm as to get yeah. in the creek, yeah, yeah. get down, um, not be totally okay with a random spritz of water hitting my camera you know but getting down getting you into the thing 
Um, that would be the hallmark of a landscape, a good waterfall, a good you know, type of photo. Sure. And I think with the street photography, that's an analogy worth making. It's like, if you're just kind of leaning your back on a wall and just kind of like not putting any effort. And I, I, let me ask you this. Sure. Is there, what, what is, is there a school of thought or an opinion about people who just kind of like pre-focus and kind of hold their camera at their waist versus having your camera up and like doing your thing? Um, I, I, people seem to be kind of split on that. Fo there are folks who fully advocate, you know, don't shoot from the hip. And there are folks who uh -huh. advocate do shoot from the hip. And there are kind of merits to both. I mean, a lot of what I do, I shoot with my phone. So it's not even like if I held it to my eye, I, I can't even, I can't sure, even see anything. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I'm either, I'm holding it kind of like close to my chest because I can, I know compositionally how the lens works and where I need to hold it to get like what I'm seeing and what kind of angle I want it from. Um, sure. I, 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 like you had said before, do it. You have to do it with intent. Um, yes. You have, you kind of have to have a reason for shooting the way you're shooting. Um, yeah. And uh, I've, I mean, for me, I, I shoot with intent with my phone, and there are certain ways I need to get the image that I can't, like I can't hold it here. Yeah. Um, so it oh, that make, uh, largely depends on the approach. Um, and if folks, if you ask and they don't really have a reason, that they, they probably haven't developed um, their intent and their way of talking about their own photography to sort of justify the means. Perfect. Like, that, I think, that sums it up perfectly. Like, I'm okay. I love, like, a, a photographer who scopes out, say, a brilliant architectural space. Like, sure. They, they, they're up above and just compositionally the architecture flows and then they wait and they wait for that right person to walk through, you know, and usually they're kind of like the small little tiny little. Frame. Yeah. I love that stuff. To me, that's like, that shows method. It's a different type of kind of candid. Sure. Um, where, where they're kind of painting the scene with the architecture, but they're waiting for the right person. Um, I just, I don't know. Yeah, I think we've, we've established that we're on the same page there. Like, I'd say there's more bad street photography than good. It's, it's harder to find the good. Yes. Because you gotta kinda, yeah. you got to kind of like push through the weeds a little bit to find the, to find the, the good stuff. Yeah. Um, so something I ask uh, of photographers in all these interviews, it's a question tailored to the photographer's experience. Um, mm -hmm. If you could give one piece of advice um, for someone looking to get into architectural and landscape photography, um, what would that one piece of advice be? The way I see it, all photography, um, the inherent quality of photography is that it's meant to be shared, right? So you don't, I don't know anyone, myself included, who takes a photo with the sole purpose of keeping it for myself. Um, I take photos because I want to share my interpretation of whatever is in front of me. Mm. Um, and so for people who are getting into it, um, so it, it might not be exclusive to an architectural photographer or a landscape photographer, mm -hmm. it's really, I think any photographer, um, is when you share, um, understand that you should ask yourself whether everything you do, is it helping my brand? Is, mm -hmm. it, is it going to... Um, add consistency in tone? Is it going to um, expand my reach? Um, you know, because what you want, if you want to share, if you, or if you're saying, hey, I want to share, then the re reciprocal of that is you want it to be seen by as many people, right? Sure. So just, I see a lot of people who, a lot of photographers who, who they they think it's the photographer, the, no, they think it's their photos that will find them success. And it's not. The photos are just a component of it. It's, it's the brand. It's, it's them. It's, I don't ever want someone to be like, oh man, mm. I want to work with you because of the photo you took. I want them to say, I want to work with you because of you. Mm -hmm. So um, my advice to photographers is simply to figure out what your brand is, what it looks like. 
you know, deliver a 30 second elevator pitch of what, you know, who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just drill that in. Um, don't fall into the pit of what's easy. Mm -hmm. um, it's so easy to take the same photo of the Brooklyn Bridge or the same photo of Multnomah Falls. Mm -hmm. um, you gotta, you gotta kind of sometimes get your feet into that creek and get, you know, water and like, you know, try going in an elevator. I'm not condoning it, but like, you know, sure. try to get, you know, higher up than you normally would. Right. Um, but like, you, you have to start thinking about what it is, what can you do to um, add your own particular voice to the photo? Um, and that's not easy. And it's not supposed to be easy. Mm. It's a, what's the point if it was easy? Why would we'd all, if it was easy, then we'd all have the same unique shots of something. Sure. Um, you know, it's hard and it takes mm. a lot of time. So like, you know, it's not, I'm not trying to give kind of generic advice, but it's true. It's like, yeah, you know, so. Got it. Well, thanks so much um, for taking the time to talk. It's been great. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for watching. This has been ISO 400. If you'd like to see more of Brian's work, you can check out his website, brianmatiash.com, or you can find him on Instagram, at brianmatiash. And if you like what we do, please hit subscribe down below and share this with your friends. Thanks so much, and see you next time.